If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be smooth and sly. And here's why. In this episode, we're going to find some answers to where else can you find roguish inspiration? And what traits do good rogues exhibit? And who were some of the coolest rogues from history? Of which there are a ton. A plethora, if you will. Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast. I'm Travis. And I'm his brother, Jordan. These holidays are killing me slowly. Why? Because while every family member and person, there's parties, there's things, there's, you know, you got end of the year stuff and everyone's going crazy. I don't know. I Bunch just, of delights. I Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, yeah, no, I'm not getting that. You know me. I'm, I'm not a holiday kind of person. You're what they call a Grinchington <laughs> of the holidays. <laughs> Mr. Season. Grinchington, if you please. <laughs> but yes, today we're putting aside our gripes about the holidays in order to focus once again on rogues. And of course, we can go on and on and on for days about the cool rogues from movies. Yeah, we talked about this, but the list is very, very long of cool rogues in movies that I think are the inspiration for a lot of D&D characters. Yeah. But, I mean, those are all written characters. But what about the real ones? The real, like, if you want a gritty rogue, don't go to movies where they've been created and massaged to just be the perfect rogue. You go to history. Where people really put their lives on the lines for things that they believed in and tricked governments. And so you've chosen a few rogues to focus on in this episode. Based on what? Well, I thought it would be cool to focus on a subclass and kind of the morality of the rogues that we talk about. Okay. Just to show that, you know, you can play good or bad or whatever. Yeah. Just so that you don't end up getting kind of pigeonholed. I love to pigeonhole my rogues into this very narrow focus of what I really enjoy about rogues. And it's kind of hard. I find I get into traps. And I just kind of spin in this very narrow scope of what a rogue can be. And it's really hard to get out of that. I find it's like a vortex. It's like a dark sun has collapsed. And now I'm just stuck in this idea for my rogue. And sometimes it takes a little bit of inspiration to get me out. And I think that's part of the danger of starting with your class when you're making a character. It's just walking right into that pigeonhole. And I guess this is also to show that if you've got an idea for maybe a heroic or goodly character, they can still be a rogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to go paladin or cleric just to play someone that's good. Fair enough. So we've got a selfish thief that we're going to talk about. We have a vengeful swashbuckler. (laughs) Swash. Swash. I'm going to swash your buckles. (laughs) And finally, a noble trickster. Cool. Well, let's explore more of those in Archives of the Ancients. Hooray! This is the Archives of the Ancients, where knowledge is unearthed to add wild insights to our world. Okay, so since you're the evil one of the two of us... (laughs) Jesus! This is how you see me? This comes out now, huh? Well... Come on. All right, fine. I'll own it. <laughs> definitely. Definitely on the more evil, roguish bent. Sure. So why don't you take us away on the first of our rogues, the <laughs> selfish thief. Yes, that's definitely me, the selfish thief. Uh, Sorry, and- <laughs> you have good qualities too, Travis. None untrue. Fake news. So my selfish thief is Jonathan Wild. He was known as the Thief Taker General and the Great Corrupter. Those titles alone. Right? (laughs) 
How <laughs> cool <steal> are those? <laughs> the Great Corruptor? That is... Yeah, that's some serious rogue vibes he's rocking there. Yeah. So, Jonathan Wilde was born in the late 1600s. He was the first of five kids in a really poor family. Their father was a carpenter. Mother was an urban fruit vendor. All fairly run-of-the-mill in the late 1600s of London. Yeah, normal kid, big family. Well, he didn't grow up in London. He actually grew up outside London, but went to London as a servant and was very quickly dismissed by his master. Too dastardly. Yeah, maybe not at this <laughs> this stage. Okay. I mean, I don't think his dark heart was really coming out quite at this uh, point in his life. However, once he was released, he landed himself in debtor's prison. Okay. And then he started running errands for all the jailers. He was like, not quite. I, I guess at the time, debtor's prisons were all over the place. Like, you had prison prisons for really bad people. And then just people that, I mean, everyone was poor. So you needed something to do with all of the, the folks that weren't paying their debts. Sounds like, I don't know, kind of a waste of prison space. Yeah. Well, they had lots of space, I guess. I mean, I'm in debt. <laughs> Should I go to prison? Should I know something? Should I be worried? <laughs> I'm not into white collar crime or anything, but <laughs> so he actually got himself out from time to time by working with the jailers. And at the time he earned enough doing errands and helping catch other thieves to be let out to help do that. So he was kind of kind of an informant. Okay. More or less. Like he was just kind of tipping people off and helping them catch some of the thieves that were running London. Like at this time, crime was crazy rampant. Mm. And then he met a prostitute named Mary Molyneux who taught him to become a criminal and brought him into her gang. Excellent. Joined his first gang. So far, so good. We got a pretty good origin story going on. Yep. So then he started working with this man named Charles Hitchens, who was the city's top policeman. He was like the, the top cop. He was the commissioner. Nice. Except that he was also incredibly corrupt and would extort money out of people all the time. So I was going to say like Commissioner Gordon, but yeah, the no, dark no. side. No, like if Commissioner Gordon was a shitbag. <laughs> so when Charles Hitchens was eventually caught, he followed kind of in his footsteps and was working under his office, but not officially. So, like, he was telling people that he was still kind of working as the top cop kind of thing and using all of his previous recommendations and, and office okay, to still operate under that. Even though Charles Hitchens went down, he was like, nah, I'm still, I'm now the guy. He still had the connections yeah. and the influence. Exactly. Interesting. Then he started catching other thieves for the reward money in an unofficial capacity. And we're still talking about Charles Hitchens. No, no. We're talking about Jonathan Wilde. Okay. So he starts using Charles Hitchens, all of his connections. Okay. And still running with that. Gotcha. And then he pretty much grew the biggest gang of thieves in early 1700s in London. Like he ran the town. He hustled. Yeah. So he kept stolen goods. He found that it was actually... A lot easier to get away with thievery if you stole the goods and then eventually gave them back. And at the time, because crime was so rampant and thievery was so rampant all over the city, there was lots of money going out to anybody that could help catch thieves or return stolen goods. Okay. So he was just wandering in and was like, hey, I found your stolen shit, even though it was my dude that stole it. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't say that last part. I no, guess. he <laughs> left that out very conveniently. Pretty clever little racket. Yeah, it was pretty good. Because it was so big in the news, everyone was interested in both thieves and the thief catchers. Yeah. So that was like top news. Everyone was reading about it. The printing press and newspapers were just like, making this super accessible to everybody. So everyone in London was really interested in what was happening in this daily drama that was unfolding. And Jonathan Wilde was becoming a big name in catching thieves. Exactly. 
So he's catching all the thieves. He's returning all of this stolen merchandise. Everyone's throwing <laughs> money his way. And in some cases, he's even collecting the reward money on other rival gangs. So when he knows that he's got enough to actually convict a rival gang because of the stuff that he knew as a thief himself, Jeez. then he would go and turn them in. And the reward money was not small. At the time, it was like 700 pounds or something like that. But in today's equivalency, that's like 123,000 pounds, British pounds. Wow. Like that's a ton of money. Good Lord. So he was raking it in. He was both a criminal kingpin and a public hero, and he used the press to bolster his reputation. And he even used the press to actually threaten people because he would steal really valuable items from people while they were at places of ill repute. And then actually take out newspaper ads that blackmailed them <laughs> saying, I know where you were. And if you don't come out, like I, I'm going to smear you. Wow. So just ruthless, just mm. absolutely ruthless. And eventually what led to his downfall was he got into a serious spat with this other thief, this really handsome thief at the time who was kind of on the other side of that spectrum in the news was he was the handsome thief, Jack Shepard. And he defied him for a long time because every single time Jonathan Wilde would catch him and put him into jail, Jack Shepard would escape. Hmm. So Jack Shepard is driving Jonathan Wilde completely nuts. And while he does this, this led to a year-long struggle where in that year, Jack Shepard was both caught, jailed, and escaped four times over. Wow. They kept doubling down on like how to imprison this dude, and he just kept getting out. Nice. Another roguely inspiration. Exactly. And so it was actually this whole going back and forth that really distracted Jonathan Wild from what was really going on. And he was, the public was kind of starting to turn on him going, all right, I don't really suspect this. Crime is too rampant. What the hell is going on? Nobody's trust trustworthy. So Jonathan Wilde was losing all of his public goodwill. Oh, uh, in this fight? Yeah. So it distracted him too long. Anyways, eventually he left town because shit was getting too hot. And then he came back to town thinking, ah, this is all blown over. And the city said, no, we're on to you. We're on to your <laughs> bullshit. Also, we caught you trying to help one of your thieves escape from prison. Oh. So that's kind of black and white. We finally have what we need. Kind of takes away from his reputation. A little bit. Man, it's hard <laughs> to stay on top of the criminal underworld. No doubt. And yeah, so then he was caught and hanged. Bummer. <laughs> that's the end of the story of Jonathan Wilde. So what are some of the roguish takeaways that we can grab from that story well right off the top what a couple of badass names yeah jonathan wild jack shepherd those are rogue names those are great rogue names <laughs> those are great hero names in, yeah. in general like oh what a fantastic dickensian era name i think one of mine is d just kind of the duality of rogues so this is something again one of those pigeonholes that I usually put my rogues into that I'm always trying to get out is the like, oh, I'm going to wear a mask and I'm going to wear black and I'm going to have a cloak and a cape and a this and a that. Yeah. And I'm going to carry, he's going to be strapped with daggers all <laughs> over his body. And it's like, okay, but you can't walk around like that. You have to have a little bit of legitimacy. You're going to be watched by oh. every guard wherever <laughs> you go. That's like the same as you know, seeing a sports car on the road. Like, you know that they're getting pulled over more than you are in your minivan. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Like, you're you're a walking billboard for don't leave me around your valuables. Yeah, yeah. So what I liked about this story of Jonathan Wild was that he was convincingly the good guy. And yeah, so you can't just walk around looking like the stereotypical rogue. You got to appear legit because you have to function in society. Yeah. One of my favorite things I did with uh, my rogue was have him running an orphanage. I set up the orphans to start picking pockets. And in order to placate the rest of the party, I said, don't worry. I'm putting up uh, signs that say, beware of pickpockets. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> because I'd done a little bit of research, and apparently real pickpockets would do that. They would put up a sign that said, beware of pickpockets in public areas, because as soon as you see that sign, you check to see that your wallet or your watch is still Your valuables, there. wherever your valuables are, a pickpocket sitting on the bench across from the sign, they see somebody reach for their pocket, they go pick their pocket. Brilliant. <laughs> so another point from that story is having a solid rival. You could work it into your backstory, share it with your DM, give them something to build off of as they're kind of crafting the story on their end. Give your rogue something to care about more than just that money and power. Mm. Yeah, a rival can give so much gravity. And the problem that a lot of rogues, I think, get into is that when you only care about money or, you know, I'm trying to build the ultimate badass and I go, my badass doesn't care about nothing. And it's just like, okay, but now what's going to motivate you? <laughs> yeah. So you can be not motivated by valuables or money or fame or prestige or anything else like that if you have the Joker to your Batman. Yeah. It keeps getting out of prison. Yeah. Jonathan <laughs> Wilde and Jack Shepard. Like, that's such a good rivalry that is so meaty and it just, it can constantly fuel your rogue. But like you said, you got to make sure that your DM is in on that and can try to find ways to work that that rival into the story. Yeah. As an antagonist, that's that's a great story. I think my final takeaway from that one, though, is just having an ego. Like, I love a good rogue with a crazy ego. <laughs> But I think that has to end one of two ways. You either have to have some kind of character arc growth, which I definitely think is the more preferable of the option, because you can't stay just a two-sided coin for the entire duration. Like if your character is going to build and become something that means a lot, then there has to be kind of multiple facets. If you've got that ego, then you learn some humility along the way. Yeah, there's a little bit of a challenge to keeping up those appearances and either you can learn to be vulnerable and learn to be just a normal person and not be such a roguish kind of person like Han Solo for yeah. instance or you have to let it be your downfall I mean that kind of ego can also really drive a rogue to do things that they wouldn't normally do like that seem ridiculous because they're just driven by that need and that is their ultimate Achilles heel yeah. that will be their undoing one day. Not learning their lesson. Yeah. Very cool. I like it. Jonathan Wild. So, the swashbuckler mm. that learned to live for revenge, which some of my favorite movies are revenge stories. They're the best. They're the so good in so your rich. soul for whatever reason. Feel bad about it. <laughs> All right, so our hero in this tale is Jeanne de Clisson, who started out pretty simply, as all heroes and rogues do. So she was married for the third time to Olivier III de Clisson and had five kids with him, and she had two before him. So she lived her life as a mother. She stayed at home. They were pretty wealthy, weren't they? Yeah. Like, crazy wealthy for the time. Yeah, they were the nobility, essentially. And they had a very good life for quite a while. She was super happy with him. So Olivier fought for the French in the War of Breton. And the French suspected Olivier of being a traitor. So they arrested him. And they sentenced him to beheading. The French at the time were just obsessed with the guillotine. Huh? They were like, let's chop off everybody's heads. No heads allowed for anyone. <laughs> You know what? Height of fashion at this time oh, was no. just being headless. Jeepers creepers. <laughs> so being a woman that was in a very happy life, this pisses her off righteously. As you do when you murder the father of your five children. Yeah. And so she does not decide to weep and mourn for the rest of her life. She takes action. Okay. She sells all of their stuff. They had mountains of wealth. She sells it all. She buys a fleet of three ships. She paints them all black. She raises red sails. Holy butts. And she names her main ship 
My vengeance. God damn, that's good. <laughs> that's so good. She had a mission. Her trio of ships gains the nickname the Black Fleet <laughs> for her actions. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love it so much. Not only this, and this might seem simple to some, but she buys an axe. Okay. And like she's where this is going. <laughs> She sails the English Channel, mercilessly targeting French ships. Ooh. She has very... So she went... Wait, she went to war with the French. Yeah. Though, yeah, obviously, I guess they they killed her husband. Yeah. But, like, she just went after French ships? Yeah, her family was allied with the French originally. They were French. And so she gets in the water. She doesn't give a shit about whatever war is going on. She just wants revenge. Very cool. Okay, so at the time, she's sailing around the English Channel, and she's just like, uh, that ship is flying a French flag? Or is she, like, targeting different, like, military vessels? Like, what's her MO? I think that's essentially it. She's just sailing around, and she sees French, and she sees red. Wow. When she gets to the ships, she's pretty, she's pretty ruthless. Her pirates that she hires. Okay. She essentially took the rest of her money and hired a bunch of mercenaries to man these ships. But they kill everyone on board, these French ships. Beans. Yeah, pretty rough. She saves any nobles that might be on board. Uh-oh. And she beheads them. Good God. Like the French beheaded her husband. Damn. <laughs> That's intense. Yeah. That is that is rough it's stuff. Bloodthirsty. But she leaves two survivors from every ship to run back to the king of France to tell him that the Tigress of Brittany is the one destroying their fleet. <laughs> this is this must be where that came. Well, I'm sure it existed before, but I love that. Like, you have survived only to tell the tales of what I've done. Yeah, that, that classic is, move. That is ruthless. And so the the French are starting to lose their shit over this, but the king of England thinks, hell yeah. <laughs> I'm liking this woman. So keep taking down those ships. Have some land. Have some titles. <laughs> some English money. Well, when you have one woman who is running around the seas doing <laughs> most of the fighting for you and just like ruthlessly undermining the French and all of their efforts in that time and era. Yeah. And damn. I have to imagine that when the king contacted her, she's just like, what? What do you want? Uh... <laughs> Keep it up. And you said that this one actually ended with a bit of a happy ending, right? Yeah, it went better than a lot of roguish endings do. She actually got to keep her land and title. Like that's the the English protected her yeah. once all of her fighting was done. She calmed down a little bit eventually, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you only have to kill like 500 people before you finally get all that, that rage out of you. Jesus. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's intense. intense. Jinx. All right. So roguish takeaways from this one. Clearly, there's a lot of very roguish traits going on here. But you can start from a position of power. You don't always have to start in the, you know, the rugged streets. Oh, the squalor of, yeah, I learned my trade. See, this is a little bit contentious because... I've always subscribed to the idea that you should never make the coolest stuff that ever happens to your character have happened in their backstory. Right. So that's a little bit challenging and discongruous, but I think what you can kind of take from that is that, like, she did come from money. She came from wealth. She came from privilege, but she wasn't... She didn't do all of her dragon slaying while she was in that role. So you don't necessarily have to be an urchin, but you do have to have been boring prior to <laughs> your game and that's i think one of my biggest things for new character creation and people tend to fall into that trap yeah of like oh yeah you know my rogue was uh king and uh did you know survived so many wars and adventures and this st and it was like okay well i cleared never... the lands of dragons yeah i got all the treasure that yeah in this game so, yeah, you can come from royalty and nobility. You just can't be uber cool. Like, she was just a stay-at-home mom, essentially. Yeah. Before she became the pirate badass that she <laughs> eventually was. And as you mentioned early on in this one, 
the simple fact of naming your stuff makes it so badass to a group of gamers. Those ship names? Yeah. My Vengeance? <laughs> that is gnarly. That is so cool. Yeah. Even if the things themselves are, are unremarkable. But yeah, as soon as she got some ships, those are ships were probably, like you said, very unremarkable. But she blinged them out. She was like, hell yeah, I'm putting up red sails and I'm painting my ship black. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to terrify anybody that comes near me. I always so, love doing that in Dungeons and Dragons with a cart that you're yeah. traveling with or a wagon. <laughs> That's right. You're, like, you're, I think your rogue put a dragon skull on the front of the cart once. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. You make you make a statement if you've killed a dragon. <laughs> and I think my favorite bit about that story was Jeune de Clason had a a driving need, like just one thing, and had a calling card. And so I don't know, just having something that the entire party knows that your rogue will always do in a certain scenario. So like you said, she saw red when she saw a French flag. And she was like, those bastards are going down. Mm. And like always having kind of that trigger that's like, at this point, you know, as soon as this happens, X happens, the result, regardless if it means my own death, is going to be this. Yeah. Like, at all costs, this is what's going to happen. Now, it might not need to be quite so blind and bloodthirsty. That's fair. I'm sure most of those French soldiers didn't behead her husband. <laughs> most of them. 99% <laughs> of them had nothing to do with her husband. Yeah. However, yeah, I get that. And I don't know. I would say that if you're playing in a party where you're just like, if I see anybody from this nation, like, I'm going to kill them like that's gonna piss off your party yeah but i do like the idea of just being like okay if i'm in a tavern i'm doing this or you know it's just it's it's something that the party can count on yeah. your rogue and just like uh oh we gotta control them we gotta uh oh like how are we gonna deal with this and that's kind of the fun of being a chaotic kind of rogue Sorry to pull from a movie reference once again, but that reminds me of Marty McFly and Back to the Future. Oh, exactly. That's exactly what I was trying to talk about. You chicken, McFly? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> I mean, it's super corny in that I'm, example, but... I'm pretty sure that that is the second time a Marty McFly reference has come up <laughs> to that specific scenario. Everyone in D&D &D should be Marty McFly. That's the lesson. No, that is not the lesson. All right. Moving right. on. Okay, so our final rogue hero is, in my opinion, the ultimate arcane trickster because of one of her most fabled moves. I'm really curious how you're going to tie this back to an arcane trickster <laughs> from a historical record. But I know. Go on. I'm stretching the boundaries here. No, this is this is intriguing. But she sounds really cool. She rebelled against the invading forces in the defense of her people. So far, so good. That's a story. Does not necessarily sound like the motivations of a rogue, though. A rogue is always, well, stealing or murdering people, right? This is very true. Yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jalkari Bai, she was born in Bojla in India. It's a small village. And her story starts out simply as well, but on the other end from our previous rogue. She was raised very poor. Her mother died young and she was raised by her father. Okay. Their only child. She didn't have any formal education, but she was trained to wield a weapon and ride on horseback. And this was in the 1830s. Okay, cool. All right. So she's already being kind of trained to defend herself. Like I would, I would assume that's maybe more than most young women in India got taught. Yeah, I mean, of any place at the time, it was yeah. probably more than they were trained in that regard. I mean, I don't know how to wield a weapon or ride a horse. <laughs> <laughs> All I know how to do is walk and talk into a microphone. I'm useless. <laughs> but she became great through some trials in her younger days. For example, one of the stories is that when bandits attacked her village, they attacked a businessman in her village. 
and there wasn't a lot of defense at the time. And so she single-handedly drove these bandits away. Because she knew how to wield a sword like a badass. Yeah. 16-year-old girl <laughs> running at you with a sword. Yeah, you run. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know how much of this is folklore and how much of it is true because the facts get a little mixed. But But she killed a tiger when it attacked her in the jungle. And all she had with her was an axe. Damn. There are other tales where it's a lion, or not a lion, sorry, but uh, I forget what kind of a large cat. But in the other versions of it, she's just got a stick that she was herding cattle with. Hmm. Cool. So she took down some kind of a large jungle beast. I'm going to err on the side of that's goddamn awesome. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, all right, go on. So where the kind of roguish trickster comes in is that she was noticed by the queen of the state of Jansi, the queen being Rani Lakshmibai. And she was noticed because she had a striking similarity to the queen in both her build and her face. And, you know, if I were the queen and I saw this badass doing all this stuff, I'd probably be like, yeah, that looks like me. (laughs) (laughs) She's, I'm just like her. <laughs> In more ways than just looking like, like, have you seen yeah. her swordsmanship? I'm, I'm the same. So once the queen heard of her bravery and her actions, she was inducted into the army. And at this point, when the British were invading India, she was trained to fire cannons. And she was trained more in the arts of warfare. So not only does she know how to wield a sword, she knows how to wield an army. Yeah, exactly. And so much so that the queen actually made her her confidant and advisor. So she had some strategy and some know-how, even though she had no formal education, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. So her big moment that is always talked about is the rebellion of 1857, where General Hugh Rose attacked John C. with a massive force. The nearby allies of the Queen had already been defeated by the British at this time, yet the Fort of Jhansi still stood strong. Hmm. But Dula Ju, a member of the Queen's forces that was in charge of one of the gates of this fort, did a little betrayal. <laughs> Can you do a little <laughs> betrayal? Or is it just betrayal? Well, yeah, kind of a bummer. She made a deal with the British. She opened up one of the gates. Oh, Bad move. Whoopsie done it. (laughs) I I did a whoopsie. I betrayed you. (laughs) So Rose's forces stormed the fort when this epic betrayal happened. And as the fighting began, all of the generals of the queen advised her to run. And they assisted with her getting through another gate. Okay. Jalkari Bai knew that this was happening. The queen was escaping. Yeah. She knew that they couldn't win against the British forces, but she did know that she could buy her queen some time. Because she looked similar. Yeah. So she throws on the queen's clothes. She runs to the front of the army and she starts doing as much damage as she can to the British. (laughs) Like not only are warrior queens epic and cool, but faker warrior queens (laughs) that are like damn i didn't know the queen could fight like that yeah she steps up to the plate and she delivers because she is described as a tigress in her own right on the battlefield yes and she's taken down the british she eventually marches right out to the camp of general rose and in a powerful voice she demands to see him when he comes out to greet her he's still believing her to be the queen he asks how she should be punished by the British. <laughs> Ballsy move. <laughs> when the warrior queen walks up to you. Yeah. Because and... the British are saying this whole time, they're just like, get out. We are in control now. You're done. Yeah. So yeah, he asks, how should we punish you? She stares him down boldly and coldly and says she wants to be hanged. Holy hell. You mean she doesn't pee her pants like I would <laughs> in this scenario? She doesn't surrender. Or she doesn't cry. Beg. <laughs> she yeah. just, just says, like, hang me, bastard. Yeah. Either get out of here or kill me now. Damn. And apparently the general was so appalled that he's quoted as saying, if 1% of the women of India were like you, the British would be forced to flee. Well, she was the tigress. Yeah. So she earned it. Damn. 
Some reports after that say she died in the battle. Others say that she was not actually killed that day and she lived on. But either way, her legacy of bravery lives on. That's such a good end to that story, too. I love the, like, who knows? Yeah. Pretty inspiring. That's pretty cool. All right. So what kind of roguish takeaways? Well, use a disguised self. <laughs> Obviously, because that's gnarly. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was the connection I made there. But I think for this one, defend the innocent. Like you were saying, you don't have to be the bad guy. She fought mm. for those that she thought needed help and that were on the right side. Like, that kind of stuff is what a paladin or a cleric declares, but that kind of behavior isn't normally from the rogue. Any of her characteristics can easily fit into a rogue as they're written anyways. Yeah. Like, as far as the mechanics go and what's needed as a rogue. Well, she's got a bit of that mastermind quality. She's got yeah. some of that swordsmanship. Yeah, I could definitely see some roguish qualities there, but also that deceptive bent of like, oh, I'm going to distract you and devise a plan while I do what's right. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, on that note, I think it's important that rogues are full of dissent and rebellion, which I think goes naturally with most rogues like most rogues work on the counter to the law and all these other kind of things like that's just an easy fit a lot of the times that's what the party is doing fighting against whatever power is corrupt in the campaign yeah whatever you know whoever needs to be knocked off their high horse the rogue is there to fulfill that need but i think that the main takeaway for me is just that she was the leader of an army she banded people together. She was the glue that held them together and then continued to fight for the right side of, of that cause. And with that, there's an important point to be made that running counter to whatever it is, is not running counter to the party, which is really tricky to do as a rogue because I think, you know, I get it in my head all the time is like, I'm a rogue. You can't control me. <laughs> and it's like, okay, but make sure that you're not doing that to your party. Yeah. That you're actually doing that for your party. You're banding them together against whatever that other thing is. You kind of start taking that devil's advocate role in every conversation. And it it can become a little taxing if it's yeah done, like you said, against your party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, I think her heroic moment. I mean, if your party has a goal... Be the distraction and let them achieve the goal. That's your moment in the limelight. That's a moment of incredible tension where it's all on the line and you've got no other way out. Well, what I love about that is that the rogue has the ability to dodge damage, to move fast, to not get hit. Like there's all of all of their abilities are scaled and kind of leaning towards that ability. But more often than not, rogues will use that ability to cut and run faster than the rest <laughs> of the party when shit goes to south. And she didn't do that. She was like, I'm going to use all of my skills to allow everybody to get away. And I have the greatest chance of, well, I mean, in this scenario, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, she may or may not have lived to fight another day. Yeah. So who knows if uh, she used all of her roguish wiles to get out of that scenario and uh, and still survive. Absolutely. Well, I think that about uh, does it. I think we've rambled on long enough about cool badasses from history. Our ramblings have given me power <laughs> to put into my games. Well, uh, last point of order, our contest was won. Hooray! Congrats, Leprechaun. For those of you that might not know, Leprechaun is a wonderful a regular participant and patron who hangs out with us on Discord all the time. And uh, it was really kind of a badass, speaking of badasses, really <laughs> badass way to finish. Um, because at that point, I think there was four guesses. And Leprechaun said, is it this? And I said, nope. And is it this? Nope. Well, then it must be. And I just loved the confidence. It must be this. And <laughs> I was like, the Damn, only thing left. you're totally right. Nice job. So what what was the elusive beast? The elusive beast was a nilbog. Aw, shit. 
yeah. a trickster themselves. So yeah, thank you very much for participating. Thanks for um, the reviews. Thanks for the guesses. Oh yeah, it was a, it was a ton of fun to run this one. Um, Leprechaun, you have a copy of the monsters know what they're doing by Keith Almond heading to you right now. All right. Well, thanks for listening, and thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects you heard in this episode. You can follow us, see what we're doing on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and Reddit. Hook and Chance. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. And Simag GR. Yow. Damn it, Nilbog. <laughs> Roguish trickery. <laughs> and Nilbog is it.